We've had a great time of worship, and now we're going to have the opportunity to dive into God's Word. Are you ready? Amen. Listen, sometimes in life, you have to pump the brakes, slow things down, take a look around you, and really drink in the moment. This is one of those moments for me. So I've had the privilege of being on this platform for almost 20 years, serving at various capacities. But this, tonight, is the first time that I have come to this platform to share the message that the Lord has placed on my heart. So it is truly an honor for me to have an opportunity to bring the word tonight. I need to say a couple of thank yous. First of all, I would like to thank God for his grace, for his mercy, and for salvation. Because without that, I would not be here tonight. Secondly, I want to say thank you to Pastor Carl. Shout out to Pastor Carl. We have like 20 plus years of ministry together. And Pastor, I appreciate uh, your support, your love, your leadership and uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. I do not take that for granted. So if we could do this, why don't we put our hands together and thank God for all the great things that he is doing in our lives and in our church. Let's do that. Let's give Jesus praise. Now, every one of us here tonight, those in this room, those of you who are uh, online. All of us are uniquely different. There are new two, no two people who are the same, but we are all uniquely different. But even in our uniqueness, there are similarities. There are things that we have in common. Now, they say that all of us have a twin somewhere in the world that there's someone in the world that looks just like you, Wayne, that looks just like me. Now, I don't know about you, but in my lifetime, I've had people to accuse me of looking like certain people, mostly movie stars. <laughs> that was a joke. I'm glad you laughed. So I had a lady come up to me once, and she said, has anybody ever told you you look like, are you ready, Steve Harvey? Now, how many of you know who Steve Harvey is? Yes, everybody knows Steve Harvey. Now, Steve Harvey now spo sports a bald head, right? Uh, but that was not the Steve Harvey of the old days. So normally when somebody says that to me, I'll look up the person, get a picture of him so I can see if it's accurate, right? So I've got a picture, I think, somewhere of Steve Harvey. <laughs> what y'all think? <laughs> no. I'll let you in on a secret. So back in the day, I, I had a thick mustache. That's a double-decker mustache. And so I, I think that's what she meant. My wife would probably say I look better than Steve Harvey. So anyway. But in our uniqueness, there are similarities and things that we have in common. So I want to talk to you tonight about one of the things that we all have in common. And here's the thing. We all exist primarily to be used by God. All of us exist to be used by God. So I want to talk to you tonight about the fact that God wants to use you. But the question is, will you let him? So the title of my message tonight is that. It's God wants to use you. Will you let him? The text we're going to read from tonight is Exodus chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 10. So if you would stand so that we can honor the Lord as we read his word. Now Moses was pastoring the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not being consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burning up. 
And when the Lord saw that he looked, that he turned aside to look, God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. And then he said, do not come near here. Remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their outcry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. And now come, I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would breathe life into us. God, I pray that you would reveal to us that which you would have us uh, to hear and know and understand tonight. God, I pray that you would help us to not only be hearers of the word, but doers. These things we ask in Jesus' name. And everyone said... Amen. You may take your seats. God wants to use you. Will you let him? Now, that seems like a slam dunk statement, question, and answer. But before you answer with a quick yes, I have three words I want to say to you. Not so fast. Not so fast because there are a couple of details about the title of this message that I want to point out. We may have the message title that they can put up so you can see it. God wants to use you. So the statement God wants to use you is not a casual God wants to use you, period. But it is an emphatic statement. God wants to use you, exclamation mark, designed to get our attention. Because sometimes in life we fall asleep at the wheel. The question, will you let him... It's not simply, will you let him, question mark. It's, will you let him, dot, 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 question mark. Now, there's an official term for dot, 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 and it's called ellipsis. E-L-L-I-P-S-I-S. And ellipsis comes from uh, a Greek word meaning omission. And that's exactly what it does. Dot, dot, dot tells us that something has been left out. God wants to use you. Will you let him? Dot, dot, dot. Let me tell you what's left out. God wants to use you. Will you let him do the things that he desires to do to you so that he can do the things that he plans to do through you? You see, before God uses us, he normally prepares us. So there's three points I want to give you tonight. God wants to use you. Will you let him? Point number one, will you let him sever your nevers? I could hear some of y'all saying, hmm, I wonder what that means. Will you allow him to sever your never?" I believe all of us have a never or two or three or several on the inside of us. You see, we have things that we say we could or can never do. We have things that we say we would never do. But the old saying is, never say never. The best way to illustrate this would be to tell a personal story. So my wife and I, we met back in 1989, just a few years ago, just a few years ago. 
And we met in the mall of Memphis. It was a blind date. I had never seen her before in my life. My cousin called me up and said, will you meet me at the mall? I want you to meet my girlfriend's niece. I already had a date that night. True story. I actually, I don't have time to tell you the whole story. If you want to hear the whole story, get the book or invite me to coffee. <laughs> anyway, we met in the Mall of Memphis. We left the Mall of Memphis. We went to TCBY Yogurt. So we got in my car. She rode with me. Uh, I put my demo tape in because I was a singer back in the day. So I put my demo in and I let her hear a couple of songs that I had written and, and, and was singing. Uh, she was not impressed. Uh, but anyway, we, we sat down, TCBY Yogurt, and we started to talk. And all I talked about really was Jesus. Because we met in November, and in August, I had just rededicated my life to the Lord. Now, here's a part of the story I need to rewind and tell you. When we met, I had a seven-month-old son. Well, you wrap your mind around that. When she and I met, I had a son who was seven, seven months old. Seven-month-old son when we met. And my son, Jovan, was born in April. So I became a father before I became a husband. I got the cart before the horse. Now, how many of you know the horse is supposed to pull the cart? But when you're out doing your thing, when you are living your own way, when you have the reins of your own life, when you're not paying attention to God, then this is what we do. We get the cart before the horse. So fast forward, the Lord got a hold of my heart. It ended up being a catalyst for me to get myself back into church. I rededicated my life to the Lord. And so my wife and I, we, our, our relationship progressed really, really fast. So before long, we were talking about marriage. And so I remember my wife said to me, she said, I told myself I would never marry a man who already had a child. Never say, never. Now, three states later, Memphis, New Mexico, Texas. Three cities later, Memphis, Albuquerque, Lubbock. Three sons later, Caleb, Jordan, Christian. 30 years Later, guess who's glad my wife decided to sever the never? This cat, right? <laughs> I believe there's two reasons at least why we sometimes fall into the trap of uttering the word never. I think we get into thinking uh, that we know more than the Lord knows. We can allow ourselves sometimes to think that we know what's best for our lives. In other words, we trust ourselves more than we trust God. The second reason I believe that we can get into uh, uttering nevers all the time is that we have more confidence and trust in our own strength than we should. When we say, I will never or I would never. There's a story in the Gospels that reminds me of this fact. Mark 14, 27 through 31, Jesus talking to the disciples, he said, you will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you to, into Galilee. And Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you, yourself, will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will, what is it? Never disown you. And all the others said the same. Peter overestimated himself. And sometimes we tend to overestimate ourselves. But just as we don't want to 
overestimate ourselves or our abilities. We don't want to underestimate ourselves either. Scripture declares to us, I can do what? All things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4 and 13. I want to share a quote with you. This is a quote by one of um, the greatest basketball players of all times, Michael Jordan, the GOAT, or so they say. Michael Jordan says, never say never, because limits, like fears, are often just illusions. Never say never because limits, like fears, are often just illusions. Here's the second point. God wants to use you. Will you let him? Will you let him disturb your comfort? Somebody say comfort. Comfort is a state of physical ease. It's freedom from pain or restraint. I'll be the first one to admit I enjoy being in a state of physical ease. I enjoy freedom from pain. I enjoy sometimes not having constraint, right? But consistently being in that place is not healthy because you can't grow. Growth is uncomfortable, and growth is sometimes painful. You remember the Peanuts, the cartoon, Charlie Brown? It was a character named Linus. Linus always carried what? A blanket. It was his security blanket. It was his comfort. In fact, one time Charlie Brown was wrestling with insecurity. And so Linus offered to give Charlie Brown his blanket because he thought it would help Charlie Brown with his insecurities just like it helped him. Linus trusted in his blanket. But you and I, we don't trust in our comfort. We trust in God. Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. In this story of Moses, remember Moses was in the luxury and the comfort of Pharaoh's palace. But then he found himself in the back, on the backside of the desert uh, with Jethro. So he went from Pharaoh to Jethro. Not death row, Jethro. That's a big shift. In Exodus 3.10, we read this in the opening. So God then says to Moses, he says, so now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. How many of you know that when God spoke those words to Moses, it was not comfortable. And Moses, just like you and I, began to rationalize with God and try to tell him why he had the wrong dude. Like, God, really? I've had those moments in my life. I remember when I first got here, I was brand new worship leader here. And all of my attention was focused on worship. And I remember somebody asking me if I would officiate their wedding. I had never done a wedding before. I was like, no, get somebody else to do it. And this was like a prominent member of the church. And I was like, I don't want to mess up your wedding, please. And so I turned him down. I believe I I turned, David did it. David Savage ended up doing the wedding because he's the wedding master. We don't like being uncomfortable. And so I want to share this final point with you, and it is this. God wants to use you. Will you let him take the reins? So as I mentioned in my story, I was doing my thing. I was making a mess of my life because I had the reins and Jesus did not have the reins. Truth be told, All of us like being in control. doesn't mean that we're control freaks, but it means that we like being in control. And I liked being in control of my life until I saw 
what I was creating. So I rededicated my life to the Lord and I handed the reins over to the Lord. I want to read uh, verses 7 and 8 again from what we read earlier in the message. And the Lord said, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their outcry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. And here's what I want to focus on on this last point. It says, so I have come down to rescue them. So I have come down. Now, the Lord is sending Moses, but he's saying here, I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians. Here's what I gather from that. God is doing the work. We're just being included. Have you ever seen in the grocery store uh, those tiny carts? Like they've got an adult cart and they got a baby cart, right? Right? And you see a mom in the store and a little kid pushing the other car. And once in a while, the mom hands the kid something from the shelf to put in their car. And the kid quickly picks on and thinks, oh, I got the car. No, you have a car. (laughs) Mom's got the car. And the kid quickly begins to think, oh, I see what's happening. We get things off the shelf and we put it in the cart. So the kid then starts to put things in the cart and now they're starting to hinder what mom needs to accomplish. Because the kid now thinks it's all about me. Throwing a tantrum because mom's taking stuff out of the cart, which is not the cart, it's a cart. I got bad news for y'all. We're like the kid with the, with the little cart. You see, mom's doing the work, the kid is included. Out of the kindness of the mother, And the grocery store, the kid is able to be included. But the enemy sometimes confuses us and gets us to think that we are the ones doing the work. God wants to use you. Will you let him take the reins? The answer to question number one, will you let him sever you're never. It's what would you say? Ooh, that's a quiet yes. <laughs> that's a quiet yes. Will you let him sever your never? Yes. Will you let him yank your blanket? Yes. Let him disturb your comfort? Yes. Will you let him take the reins? And we all said, yes. yes. And we say yes because God has the master plan. We do not. God is in control. We are not. God knows all things. He's all-knowing, and we do not. And so we say, God, we know you desire to use us. And we will say, yes. Bow your heads with me and let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, which is able to enlighten and instruct and guide us. Lord, I pray that as you called Moses and as you challenged him to do your work, God, so have you called all of us because you desire to do great things through us just like you did through him. And so, Lord, I pray that we all would be humble, and God, that we all would surrender. God, that we all would hear your voice, know that you are God, 
know that you are king and surrender our will to yours. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. I am a little bit early because I didn't want to be a little bit late. <laughs> and everybody said, amen. amen. So the worship team is coming. We are going to, if you would stand to your feet, we are going to go into another time of worship, sing one more song, and then someone's going to come up and close us out.